In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren, in the Gospel of today, our Lord gives testimony of himself to St. John the Baptist. The um, St. John the Baptist was in prison, and our Lord was still preaching. And St. John the Baptist wanted to know if what he was hearing, or who he was hearing about, our Lord was truly the Son of God, was truly the Messiah. Because at that time, there must have been other people going around saying that they were the Messiah. Messiah means anointed or Christ. And um, our Lord said, well, I'm not going to say it for myself, but just here's the works, and you take this and compare it to the prophets of the Old Testament, and you make your own conclusion. And that way, um, grace is moving souls rather than saying, you know, I am our Lord Jesus Christ, here's my, here's my signature, here's my thumbprint, and here's my something code on my telephone, and you can believe that I'm really the Son of God. No, it didn't work that way back then. It worked by the voice of God speaking in the souls, you see. And he said, um, you know, the, the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf can hear again. And blessed are the people who are not scandalized in me. And the, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Meaning, this is not about just becoming an important person by speaking to the important people of this world. This is about giving the truth of God to all souls. And that's all been prophesied in Isaiah and Jeremiah and different prophets. So the uh, servants brought that word back to St. John the Baptist of our Lord giving testimony of himself to St. John. And then our Lord gives testimony of St. John the Baptist to the crowds around him. And that's important too, because if our Lord can prove the truth of St. John the Baptist, he's proving his own, the truth of himself, because St. John the Baptist is one of the main witnesses to our Lord's divinity. When he says things like, um, I must decrease so that he can increase, he's speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, that was when people were giving recognition to St. John the Baptist as if he were already, already the Messiah. Or when St. John the Baptist says that one greater than me is yet to come, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoe. Well, he said, uh, loose, loose his sandal, loosen his sandal. So that's St. John the Baptist, who everyone was on the, on the point of worshiping already, saying, no, 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 it's not me, it's the other one. So uh, this is the um, kind of the testimony between the two, St. John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ, each one giving truth to the other. So, what is going on at this time is that St. John the Baptist is in prison. And I think we all know how he got into prison. It's not because he committed a felony or did something against the law. He was just a great preacher. And he was out in the desert or the wilderness preaching, completely separated from the world. And this is what gave power to his words. Because being separated from the world, he did not pick up, he didn't uh, assimilate, worldly ways. Also, uh, St. John the Baptist was very good at praying. He is very good at fasting. He's very good at doing penance. And he was good at uh, dressing poor. He dressed in um, camel's hair, like a camel skin. And uh, being separated, being so separated from the world like that, he was able to resist the world. And being so separated from the world like that, he was able to tell the truth to the world, expose the evil of the world, and do it in such a way that it was very convincing. So he became known as what's called a zealot, someone really on fire for the faith. And um, King Herod, uh, who's the king of Israel, but he's not really a pure Israelite, he's half Israelite, half another uh, uh, race, which are the Edomite people, but he does have the title King of Israel, and Herod was worried about St. John the Baptist preaching, but he was also impressed. He had respect and a certain amount of affection for St. John the Baptist. So he called St. John the Baptist in, so to speak, to, uh, to talk to him in his own palace about these things. Well, St. John the Baptist, for one, did not cave into the king saying, okay, I'll calm down, I won't preach so strong anymore. No, he didn't say that. And just in case the king didn't get enough of that, St. John the Baptist went further and said, and by the way, king, you are with the wrong woman. 
uh, that woman of yours is not your wife. She belongs to your brother. You took your brother's wife, and God is offended. And, um, well, this is an important lesson for us because apparently Herod was happy with this woman. This woman was happy with Herod, so no one's offended, right? No, God is offended. God is offended. Remember that. In any kind of sin, there may be some kind of sin that you can think of that seems like no one's being hurt. Who cares? God is being hurt. God is being offended. And that's what we're here for. We're here to give glory to God. And if we defraud God of some of the glory that we're supposed to be giving him, that's an offense. And then if we positively do something against the law, the law of God, then that's, that's really a crime. That's really an offense. So that's what this man Herod was doing. Uh, and uh, God was offended. And I'm sure that the true husband of this woman, his name was Philip, I'm sure he was offended too, but, you know, uh, they were happy, but that's not right. Uh, St. John the Baptist um, reprimanded them for that, and because of that, they, they put him in prison. So the king had a certain amount of respect for St. John the Baptist, even though he put him in prison. And I think we all know what happened next, is that there was some sort of feast in the king's palace, and uh, some girl, she was the daughter of the false wife of King Herod, and uh, she danced, and the king was impressed, and he said, I'll give you half the kingdom as a prize. And they said, she and the mother said, well, kill St. John the Baptist for us, and then we'll be happy. You know, try to go on a date with a girl like that. Anything I can get you to make you happy? Yeah, kill your, kill your friend for me. They're disgusting people. And that's, that's pure barbarism. And uh, the king went ahead and did that not because he was against John the Baptist, but because his reputation was on the line. You know, he had made a promise. So he went ahead and killed the greatest prophet of the whole history because uh, he didn't want to lose his reputation, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. All right, so enough of my cartoons or whatever you want to describe this as. So... Uh, Let's study the situation of St. John the Baptist a little bit. What gave him power for speaking was his separation from the world. He didn't care about what everyone else was doing in the world. He didn't care about public opinion. Uh, he didn't care about what people thought about him. And uh, he didn't go along always with the latest trend. This is what saved him. And in becoming a person that was so persecuted for God, he ended up being, becoming the greatest friend of God. So try to take that and compare it to um, how we are nowadays, or at least how we tend to be nowadays. Um, I think all of us can think of some sort of situation, either in our own families or some sort of friends around us, where... Uh, one or several members, are not practicing the truth, you see. They're somehow living in a way which is not in line with the Ten Commandments. And this is offensive to God. And so one of us might get it into our mind that, well, i, I got to tell him that so that I can help him. i got to tell him that so that God receives his glory from this person instead of receiving offense. And so you're about ready to tell this person to change their life or to, just to correct them. And someone tells you, no, 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 you can't say that. You can't say that anymore. And I said, well, say what? I can't insist on the rights of our Lord Jesus Christ with people that are living a life outside of our Lord Jesus Christ? And I would say, well, why, I, why can't I say that? And they will answer me, because, because you will alienate them. Or because they will, get, they will get so angry with you that you will lose them. Or because this will be counterproductive. And I'm thinking on my side, well, how can supporting God's glory be counterproductive? And I think that's because we have made our um, point of reference or yardstick, um, we've made it into man instead of God used to be our Lord Jesus Christ. We compare ourselves against our Lord Jesus Christ to see whether we're good or bad. Or we compare ourselves against the Ten Commandments to see whether we're good or bad. But now it's come to the point where we compare ourselves against public opinion. 
we compare ourselves against the way our be people are behaving. Um, I think I heard a remark uh, not too long ago where, um, you know, if it's not the majority who's doing it, then it's not right. Oh, I know there's a lot of negatives in that sentence, but what it means is if the majority is doing it, that's the right thing to do. And hey, no, <laughs> no, no. If St. John the Baptist had thought that way, he never would have preached. If our Lord Jesus Christ had thought that way, he never would have gone to the cross. So no, no. If the whole world's thinking it, that doesn't make it right, okay? And um, I don't think any of you are thinking that way, but just to confirm this truth to you, what makes it right is whether our Lord Jesus Christ is thinking it. Thinking it. All right, so uh, St. John the Baptist and and how we kept speaking the truth and how that's an example to us. I'd like to move forward a few centuries from St. John the Baptist to uh, someone who had his name, John, that was St. John Vianney. So that's a very important priest from the end of the uh, 18th century going into the beginning of the 19th century. And um, he was known as the Curie of Ars. So when he first came to this village where he was supposed to be the parish priest, he found that this was a very run-down church. And when he saw the village, well, the village wasn't that great either. He could tell that this was not a um, promotion to be assigned there. So uh, he got to work. Uh, what, he, what he found in the parish church was just a few people going to Mass on Sundays, and then all the rest of the village were occupying the taverns and doing work on Sundays. That's where they were instead of going to Mass. By the end of his... Uh, ministry there, so I don't know, 40 more years or 50 more years, whatever it was, it was the opposite situation. Everyone was in church, and just one or two stragglers were at the tavern down below, down below the hill, down the, down the hill, so to speak. So this was a great road that St. John Vianney traversed, and he traversed it precisely by being the one who says, hey, look, we've got to bring glory back to God. Quit spending all day in the tavern. So they're in the tavern, at the beginning anyway, and they were drinking and dancing, and not um, civilized dancing either. We're talking barroom dancing, half under the influence dancing, all sensual stuff. So um, eventually, while he was on this uh, mission, so to speak, of getting people to come to Mass, practice the faith, uh, he came up with an idea, kind of a scheme, uh, to attract people to Mass. And uh, he was going to build a, an altar, a new altar in the church, in honor of St. John the Baptist. So the word got out through the village that there was going to be a big fair or a big bazaar in about two months' time up at, this, up at the church of the Curie of Ars. And uh, there was going to be prizes and uh, games, games and food and all those sort of things to attract people. And so these people that usually like to go to the tavern, they took a day off from the tavern, they went to Mass, only to get in on the party. So uh, the bells were ringing and Mass was beginning, and finally they unveiled the new altar, beautiful new altar of St. John the Baptist. And uh, above the altar there was sort of an arch, arch, and on the arch there was written an inscription, St. John the Baptist, his head the price of a dance. Isn't that so beautiful? He was recalling that tragedy from some thousand years ago, years before, how, uh, look where dancing will get you. It'll kill the best prophet in the world. Uh, referring to Herod and his false wife and the false wife's daughter, that, that story. So the people were, um, well, before I say that, how insulting. He attracts these people up to the church and then he crashes them on the head for being dancers from the, uh, from the bar. He should be more sensitive, you know. That's the major part of the parish. So if they're doing it, it must be right. Um, are you getting the idea? I think you are. Uh, no. He is filled with the zeal for the glory of God, just like St. John the Baptist. And he wants to make sure that God gets his glory. He doesn't care about whether people get glory. He wants God to get his glory. And the people... Well, he's also concerned for them, and they're not going to get to heaven by being half drunk on a Sunday, dancing in a sensual way. So if the way to get them out of that is to huh, lure them into the church 
and have them see this uh, reprimand on the altar of St. John the Baptist, then that's what it takes. Uh, he's working for the glory of God and he's working for the love of those souls. And um, by the way, many people did convert and many people did start coming to Mass and they avoided the tavern from that day forward. Like St. John the Baptist, you know, you have to let God do the work. You have to let the Holy Spirit do the work. If you think that, well, gosh, if I say this to that person, even though it's my responsibility to say it, but if I say it, I'm going to, they're going to be hurt. And, and they're going to be um, alienated. And I won't be able to tell them anything else that belongs to God because, because I've, I've just lost them by speaking so strongly to them. Guess what? They're never going to listen to you anyway if you don't start now. So quit making excuses for not getting anything done and get on with the glory of God. There it is. So St. John the Baptist is concerned about the glory of God. St. John Vianney is concerned about the glory of God. They're probably very uh, cast out people, rejected people in their own day and age. But you know what? They're working for God. And that's what counts. So there's a saying which goes like this. Truth is certainly a beautiful mother, but she usually bears a very ugly daughter. Hatred. There it is. So this means St. John the Baptist, St. John Vianney, and you and I must preach the truth in our own way, the way God has given us, you know, our own department of preaching the truth, so to speak. We must preach the truth. But at the same time, we have to be ready for all kinds of rejection. And you know what? That's all right. That's the price we pay for being friends of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we're rejected by the world because we're preaching him to the world, well, then we're becoming a very close friend of his and vice versa. And it's coming at the price of losing our friends here in this world. And that's the glorious thing. Not the losing of the friends in itself, but the becoming a closer friend of our Lord Jesus Christ at great cost to ourselves. That's where we sort of step aside and say, let the Holy Spirit do the work. I'm not going to use my human judgment to work through this thing. I'm going to put this in God's hand. Let the supernatural grace do the work. And the saints have believed in it, and in a certain way, we're being invited to believe in that today by this lesson about St. John the Baptist. So, one might say, well, what can I do to have the strength of St. John the Baptist or St. John Vianney? And I would say, try to live away from the world like they did. Now, I'm not saying that you have to move away to the wilderness. It's not even possible here in this country. But I'm saying that we have ways of separating ourselves from the way the rest of the world behaves by... Uh, only reading certain books, only watching certain films, only participating in certain art entertainments, only having certain kind of friends, uh, if we can in our work situation, to have a position at work where we're not going to be too attacked by anti-Christian principles. We have a way that we can live away from the world. Perhaps, with not, without, perhaps not by living in the desert, but there are, there are other ways. And don't be afraid to be rejected by people once in a while. That's all right. That's good for us. That means that our friendship with our Lord Jesus Christ is growing stronger. You know, St. John the Baptist got his head cut off because he wanted to be a friend of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ was put upon the cross because he wanted to completely fulfill the will of his Father. They were rejected, very rejected by men. But they were very, very attached to God. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God, but you know what I mean. His human nature was very attached to his divine nature. Our Lord Jesus Christ, as Son of God, was very attached to his Father for being so obedient. And you will see, in the moment that you need to profess our Lord Jesus Christ, in the face of people who think it's all nonsense, you will have the strength to profess him. Because you will be living in such a way that our Lord Jesus Christ is already the source of your strength instead of 
going with the crowd being the source of your strength. Christ will already be your friend, and his friendship will be the only one that you will fear to lose. And this will be a great consolation. That you can live in such friendship with our Lord and have kind of an um, indifferent attitude about whether people of the world want to be your friend too. St. John the Baptist acquired this strength by living away from the world, by doing penance, by fasting regularly. Let's take his example and do some of these things ourselves during Advent so that we can build up this strength of professing God as he did and as St. John Vianney did. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.